Uh, today we're going to discuss engines and electricity in the same video. Now, bear in mind, this is the first video I've ever made, so make sure your expectations are excruciatingly low. That way, I'll only disappoint you a little bit. Uh, so electricity is the uh, flow of electrons from one atom to another. Of course, in the nucleus of atoms, you have protons and neutrons. Protons are positively charged, neutrons have no charge, and then floating around the atom are electrons. Now these positive and negative charges are attracted together, and that's what holds the electrons in the atom. And now, of course, if you take away an electron, you're taking away one negative charge, so now this atom is positively charged, now it's attracted to an electron. But anyway, the, the um, flow of electricity is the movement of electrons from, uh, from one atom to another. And the more conductive something is, the easier that it moves uh, from one atom of this substance to another. And so here we have our, our battery here. So in this diagram, electrons are flowing from the negative here through your light bulb and your positive because these uh, electrons are attracted to this positively charged side. And, um, and of course, this is, you know, you're storing electricity in the, in the form of like, you know, chemical changes. And so one useful formula uh, is E over IR, which is Ohm's law. And now uh, what you do with this is if you have any two, you can determine the third. Now, of course, E is voltage, I is amperage, and R is resistance. Now, let's say, for example, I have a light bulb, and this light bulb is 12 volts, and I know it's 1.2 ohms. So, and I have my I over here. This is the one I want to know what this is. So what I do is I take my 12, and I divide it by 1.2, and that gives me 10. So that light bulb is 10 amps. Now, wattage is voltage times amperage. Now, wattage is useful for converting from one voltage to another uh, and figuring out if, if your ratios of power are correct or not. For example, let's say you have a power supply, one of those boxes to plug into the wall. Now on this power supply, on the label, it says 120 volts, one amp. That is your input. So the output, it says 12 volts, but it doesn't say how many amps. So to do, uh, on the output, so to determine the amperage, you take 120 and you multiply it by one amp, and that gives you 120 watts in. And so now, to figure out your wattage out, you take 12 and you multiply it by A. So 120 is equal to 12 A. Now you just divide by your 12, and that gives you 10, and that's your amperage. Now that is assuming. Your power supply is 100% efficient, which it will never be. So, let's say it's 90% efficient. You take 0.9, which is 90%, multiply it by 120 watts, it gives you 108 watts out. So 120 watts in, 108 watts out. You divide that by 12 volts, and that gives you 9 amps out. And this will tell you if your power supply is working or not, and it'll give you an idea of what you should have going in and out. So wattage is also uh, very useful. Now, another thing that is good for one to know about electricity is, is voltage is pressure. So let's say you have a hose. Voltage is the distance the water travels from the nozzle of the hose. Amperage, however, is the volume of water. So if the, um, electric, uh, the, the water flows a foot away from the nozzle, it has a low voltage. If the stream of water is very small in diameter, it's a low amperage. If it travels a foot away, if the stream is like three inches in diameter, it's a low voltage, high amperage. If the stream travels 10 feet away, and it's really a small diameter, uh, then it's, it's high voltage, low amperage. If it travels really far away, it's three inches in diameter, it's a high voltage, high amperage. And that's kind of a, a basic way to understand uh, electricity using water. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Now, of course, a conductor is, is a material in which electricity flows through easily. An insulator is where it inhibits electrical flow. Now, technically, nothing is an insulator. 
If you have a high enough voltage, anything becomes a conductor. Air, ceramic, glass, anything. It's just a matter of how high uh, voltage. So, for example, in a car, in a 12-volt system, you have a thin coating of rubber on your wire. Oh, that's an insulator. When you get up to about, you know, I don't know, maybe a, a kilovolt or so, that rubber is no longer an insulator. So let me just adjust my steam engine. Oop, too much. This is all going to be one scene. We're all going to include this while I struggle here. This is going to explode because... because the worst part is he's not lying. It is actually just, I ruined the safety valve. Now that is way too fast. Now, I'm going to demonstrate air is not an insulator. You get... Now this, this transformer, it's, uh, yeah, it's maybe a kilovolt, which isn't really a high voltage, but it has a really high amperage, so that gives it a fairly unique looking arc. But anyway, we're just gonna... Now of course, see, that rubber smoking there, it burns right through the rubber, because at this voltage, rubber is not an uh, insulator. See that rubber catching on fire there? Because it's a high enough voltage, you can see it caught on fire there. It's, it's not an insulator because the voltage is so high. It'll go through air, it'll go through rubber, it'll go through whatever. So, so if you have something that is an insulator, and you don't want it to be an insulator, just crank up the voltage and it won't be anymore. This is kind of fun. Now, of course, this is a microwave oven transformer. Now, this is like incredibly dangerous right now. It's probably like really super hot, that coil. Yeah. Now, uh, I took this out of a microwave. Now, I would uh, not necessarily recommend that you go home and take something out of a microwave because I did, uh, I did a lot of research before I did this because it's incredibly dangerous. A microwave will kill you about six dozen different ways. Um, so you can do whatever you want. You can take apart microwaves until your heart's content. My only advice to you is know what you're doing first because like if you want to learn how to play the piano, you can go and sit down at a piano and just start pounding keys. And if you screw up and you hit the wrong key while you're playing a song, nobody cares. Um, if you want to learn how to take apart a microwave and you just start doing it and you do something wrong, you die. Like a piano, if you hit the wrong key while you're playing the piano, you don't die. Electricity, it will kill you. So you gotta make sure you have learned what you're doing and you're, you're fluent at playing the piano before you sit down to play that piano. Because if you push the wrong key, like in The Goonies, for example, it will kill you. So don't screw up. Make sure you know what you're doing. I, I'm not saying you can't take apart a microwave. Actually, that is what I'm saying. But make sure you know what you're doing first because it is super crazy dangerous. So, just bear that in mind. Now, steam is all torque. It's, it's, you have an incredible amount of torque. It's actually pretty fun. And actually, engines like this, they run way better on steam than they do on compressed air. Now, there's actually a reason for that. Um, once the steam gets into that cylinder, compressed air, you get it in the cylinder and it kind of pushes the piston and you're done. Well, if I get this engine, this engine or any steam engine tuned just right for steam, what will happen is that steam will go into the cylinder just before top dead center, almost like on a car we have that compression stroke, only just barely before. And that steam will get in that cylinder, it'll give like this expansion, compressed air, like that air just travels in through the valve into the engine and it pushes the piston and you're done. Steam, it actually goes in there and it kind of expands and it bursts. And now this steam engine, of course, let me just, this steam engine, the steam is coming from the boiler going into the engine. That's all fine and dandy. But like when you have, say for example, a, a locomotive like a train, that steam, you boil your water, then you take this pipe with your steam and you travel, and you have it travel through the fire on top of the fire and it superheats that steam. And that does is that, that uh, heats the steam and it gets a really dry steam. And, um, and that's, that's when you get that little expansion when the steam enters uh, your, your uh, piston there. And that gives you more power than you would have with the same pressure uh, compressed air. Now, of course, this guy here is a model of a steam traction engine. Now this, 
This exact one you see before you here is a Mammoth model TE1A, and it's um, and it this is from 19 uh, 1960 or thereabouts, like 1965. Now the actual an actual steam traction engine uh, was was from right around the uh, turn of the century. They were big, huge. Now this has very few moving parts. A real steam traction engine, they're like just hundreds of thousands of moving parts and valves and stuff. And they had eh, like 18 horsepower each. And of course, if I stood next to one, I'd probably be about this tall next to the wheel. The wheel would be slightly taller than me. And I've actually seen them in, seen, seen them in uh, person before. And, um, and what they would do sometimes, which is really fun, uh, you can actually look up videos on YouTube. You have two of them, uh, one on each end of the field. And at the bottom, you have this drum. And you move them forward. Then you have one in neutral and the other one, you put the tires in neutral, but you connect your steam engine to that drum and you pull this rope and this entire plow across the field. Both of them drive forward. This other steam engine pulls it back and they move forward, they pull it back and forth across the field. It's actually pretty fun. Um, hassle time. And of course, this guy is, you can see that little arm rocking back and forth there. Um, this is a, a reciprocating type uh, cylinder. You know, this is a really, really simple form of a valve to get this uh, engine to run. Very, very, very simple. The Probably about the easiest engine you could possibly make would have a, a kind of a reciprocating piston like this. And um, let me... You kind of see how that rocks back and forth. And I can actually reverse the direction with this lever. Now let me real quick, if I can maybe show you for a minute here. Wait a minute. Maybe not. And so in the middle, there's, there's three holes on this metal face and there's a single hole going into that piston. The middle hole is connected to the uh, steam, to the boiler, and the other, the top and the bottom holes are connected to this uh, stack here, this uh, exhaust. You can see that steam coming out of there. Well, maybe not in camera, but um, um, anyway, so what that does is this piston, it rocks and it lines up so this hole, the steam, it, this pressurized steam and it goes into the piston it pushes the piston and it rocks this and so now this valve it, it slides over a uh, the piece of metal and you know the piston just finishes going over here the piston starts coming back just as this hole in the um, cylinder gets up to this exhaust port and the piston goes and it pushes uh, and it, it pushes all this exhaust out up here and so it rocks back and forth very rapidly. It's not very powerful, but it's very simple. And it's good for, um, it's good for a really simple model steam engine like this. Now, of course, if you want a real steam engine with power, that's where you have the sliding valves and you get all that complicated stuff. And that's when you really get some power. Look at this guy's doing this. Before it dies, you can see that motion, nice and slow there. You see that motion, that rocking motion. And I change the direction simply by changing. So right now, when this this rocker, this rocking uh, piston is up, it's at the exhaust, and when it's down, it's at the power. So to reverse that, I simply move the whole assembly down. And so now, when it's up, it's at power, and when it's down, it's at exhaust, and that's what reverses the direction. Um, originally, these. Uh, full-sized ones, right around the turn of the century, they ran on really anything that would burn. The wood or, or a straw or whatever you could shove in there. Um, and it, a lot of them now that still exist, most of them were actually destroyed during the First and Second World Wars because metal was so valuable. They melted these things down like crazy. And so very few of them still exist. And now, of course, again, this is a model. Bear that in mind. But... Um, the ones that do exist, most of them are retrofitted to run on things other than straw because, of course, you've got to sh shovel straw nonstop to keep it running. Um, so they actually retrofit them to run on, like, propane and, and, and stuff like that. 
is actually, if you see one of these, um, consider yourself special because, again, most of them were melted down um, and destroyed during the First and Second World Wars because metal was, was so valuable because we needed it for the uh, war effort. And uh, uh, Case was a, was a prominent maker of steam traction engines, and then Case went on to make um, gasoline tractors when, when gasoline kind of took over. And um, so Case made a lot of gasoline tractors. I don't, Case is still in business actually. Um, in Case, just about the 1990s, they bought up International Harvester. And so, eh, I don't think the International Harvester's really used, has been used since that point. Uh, but, um, so gasoline tractors right around the turn of the century took over along with diesel and semi-diesel tractors which which also took off and so that's why this was no longer manufactured these sorts of things and so um, a semi-diesel tractor uh, once once the piston gets up to top dead center it sprays there's a really high you know compression and there's this little pump and it sprays um, waste oil and stuff any low grade of of uh, petrol or, uh, or kerosene or anything like that it'll spray it into the uh, this red hot bulb this metal bulb and it'll instantly vaporize and combust, it'll drive that piston back. And of course, then you would, would advance it, just like you would advance a spark on a car, you advance it once you get the engine running so that it sprays it in just before top dead center to get you maximum power. And um, uh, again, semi-diesel tractors, there was no spark plug and there's no glow plugs either. You actually, to start the uh, tractor, you actually get a blowtorch and you'd set it on that, that chunk of metal and they have a piece of metal around that and an air gap to keep it hot. And you have that blowtorch going on there for an extended period of time to heat it up. But then once it's heated up, the running of the engine actually um, keeps that bulb hot and then you no longer need that open flame on the bulb. Uh, some gas engines used hot bulb ignition, some diesel engines, but for the most part, uh, for the most part, excuse me, a spark was uh, used on uh, gas engines. Now, this guy here is a model of a flyball governor. Of course, it doesn't actually function, it's just for decoration. But these two little guys here, they're designed to look like uh, balls on an actual flyball governor. So on a real steam engine or gasoline engine, this thing would rotate just like, he's, like I'm doing here. And as it rotates, as you can see here, centripetal force throw those balls outward. See that? Now, um, those balls, of course, gravity pulls them down. And um, there's also a spring there, in addition to gravity, that helps keep those balls downward. Now, as the steam engine picks up speed after you start it, this spins faster and faster along with the engine, and those balls fly outward. As they fly out, they're attached to this little mechanism, that it, and it pushes down this little rod right in the middle here. And as it pushes down this rod, it closes off the... Um, a valve that you know uh, that's connected to the steam going to the engine. So as the engine picks up speed, this thing uh, shuts off the steam to it. So it maintains a nice constant speed. Now, if I were to uh, attach this um, flywheel to something, some sort of load, this would, of course, it would take a lot of power to operate that load, and this would slow down. As it slows down, this flyball governor also would slow down, and the spring and gravity, of course, would push those balls downward. It would lift up that rod, and it would allow more steam to go to the engine, giving it more power, and it would therefore maintain a constant speed. Now, um, on a gas engine, uh, you can all, you also have like. Uh, Flyball governors that look like this. They actually stick up and they rotate and they put those on like, you know, diesel and semi-diesel and gasoline engines um, but primar Primarily gasoline, but um, and so it does the same thing. It, it uh, shuts off uh, power to the engine. Now most gas engines that have flyball governors that are um, that have a uh, they had two weights on the flywheel, one at either side of the flywheel. It just kind of inside the flywheel. Let me see if I can show you here. So right here up on the inside and right here over here on the opposite side on the inside. So as the engine picks up speed, it throws those weights outward and there's this little, it's a little finger that's called a latch finger. And this finger moves in and next to this finger there's this rod. Now this rod has a, uh, there's a cam uh, attached to the uh, engine that rotates and it pushes this rod and this rod pushes a rocker that operates the exhaust valve. And now next to this rod there's this little finger and there's this little block of metal on the rod. And so um, once the engine's up to speed, uh, this little finger 
will push inward and it'll push up against that block of metal. So the next time this uh, the cam pushes up this rod and it opens the exhaust valve, that little finger drops in behind that block of metal. So now the rod can't come back because the finger is pushing up against that rod of metal that's a, or that block of metal that's attached to your rod and it won't let the rod come back and it holds the exhaust valve open. So as the engine rotates, it simply sucks air in and out of the exhaust. It doesn't uh, suck in fuel and it doesn't compress and you know burn that fuel. But once it slows down, this little finger releases, the exhaust valve comes back. And so then when the piston moves backward on the intake stroke, the vacuum, that suction created when the piston move backward, moves backwards is what sucks that spring in on the intake valve. So the intake valve isn't actually controlled by a rocker arm or similar. It's actually controlled um, by the suction there. So that creates a vacuum and it sucks in air and fuel and it compresses it and it fires. And also throttle governed engines, sometimes they will have weights on here. And so the faster the engine goes, the more those weights are thrown outward, and the more it moves this kind of this linear um, uh, kind of a pulley. And there's this little fork that fits in that pulley that moves with it and it, it slowly closes off the um, carburetor. The purpose of a hit and miss engine is to control the speed. Now this is a Maytag engine. Uh, this is from 1928. Now this right here, you see, this is not a carburetor. This guy here is not a carburetor. A carburetor has a little mechanism to control the speed of the engine. This is there's, there's no way to control the speed of the engine with this device. Therefore, it is called a fuel mixer. It simply mixes fuel with air, nothing more. And of course this little rod controls how rich. Over here is really lean, over here is really rich. Right about here is just perfect 14.7 to 1 maximum power, maximum efficiency, right there. So this engine has no way to control the speed via the mixer. So how did they control the speed? Well you notice your spark plug wire that goes in to the flywheel here. The um, coil is actually inside of this flywheel and actually if I rotate the flywheel you see here there's this metal plate that you can remove and it, um, it it has two screws holding on so in here there's a coil and on the flywheel there's a couple of permanent magnets now once this fly or this um, yeah the flywheel gets up to a proper speed it shuts off the spark and this engine of course just coasts now this is a two-stroke engine and it therefore doesn't have any valves so you know, there's just a hole here for the exhaust and there's a hole um, connecting it to the case here. And so this doesn't hold open the exhaust valve when it's not running, it simply shuts off the spark. So when this engine isn't firing, uh, it's still sucking up air and fuel and it's still, you know, using fuel and it's blowing that fuel out the exhaust. It's just unburned. So that fuel is being sucked up out of the gas tank underneath the engine here. This is the filler cap for the uh, gas tank and over here there's this little valve to drain the gas tank and of course this valve constantly leaks so therefore it's constantly draining the gas tank even though I've replaced that valve and so it's still sucking up fuel it's just not burning it so it uses the same amount of fuel whether it's firing or not which is kind of ridiculous but um and so that's how this uh, controls its speed now this I, like I said is a Maytag engine you can actually see over here it says Maytag it's kind of hard to see it's right there Maytag and on top it would have said Maytag up in here on this plate and now this actually this engine was manufactured by Maytag like the washing machine people and so the first Maytag uh, washing machine right around the turn of the century was electric but very few people at that time had electricity so then they continued uh, selling their electric uh, model washing machine, but after that they produced a Model 72 gasoline powered washing machine. Now the Model 72, it had uh, two pistons, one here and one on the other side, and it was also a hit and miss engine. Now this one I have here is a Model 92, which is, is, um, was built later. The Model 72 was older. Now this guy uh, was built right around 1928, and I know that because of this exhaust pipe here. Now, most Model 92s, the exhaust pipe, this guy, it comes out right here in this direction in line with that cylinder. That's not the case with mine. Mine actually comes off at an angle like this, which makes mine rarer and um, and it helps me date it. So this was built between 1928 and 1929. Those are the only two years that they made this side exhaust option. All, all other Model 92s have this exhaust over here. So that makes mine a little bit rarer and easier to date. And it's kind of funny, people who uh, are into Maytag engines, they get really excited about crap like that. It's kind of interesting. Now, um, 
Uh, this is actually, of course, the original spark plug also from uh, 1928. Uh, and I'll take that off here. And um, so uh, I, I used to know this guy. Um, he used to collect uh, Maytag engines. He used to make uh, bets about uh, his engine starting on the first kick. And he, he won more uh, bets than he lost. This engine will actually it'll actually um, start without gas in the gas tank. It'll, it'll suck up just gas fumes out of the gas tank and it will uh, it'll burn those and it'll actually run. Not well, but it will run. So even if there's no gas in it, it'll start, which is kind of interesting. So after I start this engine, I got this nice dirty sock over here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the sock up against the side of the flywheel and I'm going to push my foot against it. So when this engine's idling, you'll hear it fire and then it'll It'll just slow down, then it'll fire, then it'll slow down. And then I'm going to take the sock, I'm going to put the sock and my shoe up against this engine, I'm going to push firmly. And of course, that's slowing down the flywheel, and you'll hear it, it'll fire a whole bunch while I have my foot pushed up against it, because it takes a lot more power for it to um, operate, of course, with my foot against the engine. So I will demonstrate that for you here. I like making it backfire when I shut it off. Now, um, the uh, Maytag washing machines, they made them in metal and wood. The older ones were round and wood. The uh, uh, more recent ones were square and made out of metal. Now, what you'd have on top of your, on top of your, um, your uh, washing machine, you'd, over on the side, you'd have a little, this little tab. It's like a little, uh, almost like a choke lever on a, on a car. You know, you just got that, that little round thing with a metal rod and you pull it and it has that little cable with a you know a steel inside of that cable and you pull it and it pulls on that piece of steel and that's what engages and disengages your engine so this would have a v belt on it and that belt would be loose and so you start the engine and the washing machine doesn't run then when you pull that tab up it is what it tightens the belt and it makes this engine start working and actually operating the washing machine and also it was interesting right smack dab on the middle of the top of the washing machine there's this little gear up there and then over here next to your um, little lever there was a uh, kind of a crankshaft and it, it, this crankshaft rotated and it made this piece of metal kind of go back and forth kind of like in this kind of motion and as it went back and forth kind of like this right here there were threads um, on that metal rod and these threads kind of went up against the or teeth I should say not threads these teeth went up against the teeth on this um, on, on this little post on top of the engine so as this thing went back and forth it, it twisted this gear back and forth and actually twisted the agitator back and forth and that's what agitated your clothes in the washing machine so you know of course back in the day if you were wealthy you'd have a, a gasoline powered or electric washing machine probably um, probably gasoline powered because most people didn't have electricity and so that's you were you were therefore uh, wealthy you were bourgeois because you got to go out and kickstart your engine to do uh, laundry and of course this exhaust pipe here originally this would have had a really, really, really long flexible hose on it, maybe like five feet long, maybe even more than that, maybe like seven or eight feet. Um, and at the end, it would have a little muffler, so of course you didn't fill your washroom with uh, exhaust. And actually, you can look in here and you can see there's little little spirals in there that kind of creates a little vortex when the exhaust uh, comes out. And of course, Maytag engines are notoriously loud. They really, they because uh, of course there's no muffler because most of these have their flexible exhaust missing, so it's, there's really... Um, no, no uh, muffling of that sound, and so it's uh, they're actually pretty loud. And so originally, this engine would have had a, a little metal tab attached uh, right down here to this block. And this, you see, there's a screw in there, and of course that screw is rusted. And it would this metal tab would it was kind of flat, and it came out, and it had a little thing and a bent, and it was right here. And and there was a little mm, uh, metal rod connected to that, and that metal rod traveled across the uh, top of the engine here and then right up here on top of your carburetor this metal plate stuck up and this metal rod came through that plate and there's a little uh, circle on it uh, uh, so what you do is uh, to shut this engine off you'd stick your finger through that circle and you'd pull 
it would pull that metal rod and it would pull this little tab into the spark plug and it would ground out the sh spark and shut off your engine. Of course, on my engine that's completely rusted away, so I've just kind of done this hodgepodge little piece of copper wire here. So, um, as convoluted as this looks, it's actually the correct way to shut the engine off, and that's how it was designed uh, to be shut off. That's uh, it's kind of interesting. I break my original spark plug from 1928, y'all get to enjoy it. So we're gonna... There we go. Now this is blazing hot, so I'm gonna drop it. Um, woo! Okay, so this guy is actually kind of funny. This is a champion spark plug. It actually says, uh, printed right on it. If you look here, gas engine special made in USA. That's kind of funny <laughs> that it actually says that on there. Um, and if you look here, um, this is really ridiculously long. And if you actually, I don't know, how well you can see that. Get this um, so the cement is in the background so you can see that really well. You see those um, you move over on top of it so they can see. Uh, if you look there you see uh, this one right here and this one right here are both ground. They're both grounded to the case and then in the middle that's your hot. So this actually has three pins. Most spark plugs just have two. So that's kind of funny. Um, and actually I want to see if I can get it on camera. You probably won't be able to see it, but the piston is a really funny shape. The piston's kind of curved and it has this big chunk missing so that it doesn't hit the uh, spark plug. I don't know, can you see that in there? Can you? Not really. Uh, if you zoom like way in and. It just uh, gets really blurry. If you give it a second, it might adjust. Maybe? Maybe something? Yeah, zoom it out a touch and we'll see if it can think about it. But if you get it close. Now I get my flashlight up in here and I'll move this piston. See that's the piston right there. You see that? Almost saw oh, it. I got the flashlight I moved. Okay. And so that's your piston right there. And it has this chunk missing so that you can um, so that it doesn't hit the piston or the spark plug, excuse me. So and the whole uh, the top of the cylinder in there is all curved to fit that curved piston too. So that gives you a higher compression. But um, I'm going to put this back on so tight so that I can take it off with the next guy. People aren't allowed to come over and visit anymore because everything that I would normally show them is going to be in this video, so why would I spend time with them when they can just go on YouTube? <laughs> uh, this is a uh, Cushman Cub. It's a three horsepower, model R20. They made these in, in um, one and a half, three and six horsepower, I think. Maybe it was three, six, and nine horsepower or something like that. I don't know. They made like three different sizes. Oh, actually, oh, it says right here on the plate, two, three, and four horsepower sizes. Yeah, okay, something like that. I don't know. I have no idea what I'm doing. And um, this is from approximately 1940. Uh, this here's your magneto right here, um, and this little uh, thing down here just yanks it down, and that's what causes this to spark. It's kind of interesting. And this here's your this lever is your spark advance and retard. Here's all the way advanced, here's all the way retarded. Um, this here is your case breather, so this is the back of the piston, it pushes air in out of here. It's a four stroke, so there's, you know, motor oil in there. And, um, you know, you can drain it and you can fill it and check it right there. And uh, those two things. I got your uh, your spark plug here, and uh, this thing's pretty fun. You get your finger like close to that, and it'll definitely take you out. This uh, is the intake valve. It's a really weak spring, so it's actually the suction when the piston goes back is what pulls this open. There's also a little one-way valve in here, which is what makes that kind of funny quacking sound when this thing is running. Um, it's because it's actually this thing in here is flapping. There's your exhaust just straight out of the cylinder. This is your gas tank right here. It actually says gas in that cast iron. This is for your exhaust. That's the, the valve that controls it. And this flimsy chunk of metal here is the um, throttle governing system. This is a throttle governed engine. So the slower these flywheels spin, the more it opens up this carburetor to give it more power. So when it's idling, this is all the way closed. And of course, when I put my foot on it, it'll open up this carburetor and give it some more power. It's water cooled. This is a tank of water sitting on top of the cylinder, and water goes around that cylinder. This here is where you drain your water. I usually just leave it in there because this thing is rusting like crazy. So, of course, if all the metal's underwater, you can't get oxygen in there and you can't rust, right? <laughs> so, um, and this right here is this little contraption that makes that magneto uh, spark there. And, um, oh, and this little this little lever right here is right here is what controls the air fuel mixture. So uh, you rotate it 
this way towards you and it makes it more rich and you rotate it that way and it leans it out and if you turn it too much more that way and it'll shut it off completely right now right where it's at is actually pretty good now safety time um, this engine rotates uh, clockwise when you're looking at this flywheel so optimally you should be using your left hand to start this that way when it fires right about here it jerks it out of your hand and you're done I however cannot start it with my left hand because all this so if over here I have to fiddle with, so I have to start it with my right hand. And of course when it fires, if I'm still holding on to it, I'm along for the ride until right about here is when I can let go. Like it just takes me with it and I can't let go uh, fast enough. And also, very, very important, um, when you're cranking something, any engine and you're starting it by hand, no, wrong, don't do this, you'll break your thumb clean off if it backfires. You put your thumb around like this with all of your other fingers. That way if this backfires it just yanks it out of your hand. Whereas if you have your thumb here and this backfires it takes your thumb off. It will break your thumb. This thing is a three horsepower. I'll tell you what it almost broke my arm one time. It, uh, it, it, will, it will take your thumb off. Now I gotta go find my gloves so then we'll probably cut this part out. I'm waiting this part. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a minimum of five minutes, so actually we could just do everything uncut, like, a, Dude, we should. Do a three-hour film. It'll be a, a full-length movie. Your, your club is over there on the ground. Dude, it would be a full-length movie. It'd be two hours long. Are we gonna do this? <laughs> we, I think we should. <laughs> Dude, Tasty will kick our ass. <laughs> Oh, I better get this so I can shut it off, too, eh? Pansy. <laughs> like a full-length film? That would be such a good idea. Now, of course, there's two ways you can shut this engine off. Uh, either by grounding out the spark, simply connecting this to the case of the engine. And the spark I, I tell him he should use his hand. Yeah, and so that if the spark plug doesn't spark, you just stick your finger right up in there. Or the other way is to shut off the fuel. I got this adjusted nicely, so I'm going to shut it off by grounding out the spark. And uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to shut up here. So what I do is I push this intake valve. That way when I get um, to the compression stroke, it pushes that air out the mixture. And that allows me to overcome that compression stroke. If I don't push that valve and we get to the compression stroke, I can't do it. I could, I could try, but even, even if I do a, oh shit, I could maybe try, but once I get up to that compression stroke, it, 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 you really have to be moving to overcome that compression stroke. I'll try here, but I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. Let me see here. Oh, there we go. I lied to you. I think I can. <laughs> anyway, but I like to do that because rather than, you know, fiddling with the flywheel and rotating it back and all that, I can just push this and turn and be done. Almost. <laughs> like three quarters of the way there. Even though it didn't spark even once. See, I let go prematurely because I don't like to be holding on to it when it fires. It hurts my wrist, it hurts my uh, uh, my shoulder because it just yanks and it's, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> You're gonna be half the film. Oh, it almost fired. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you guys see that that arm is still sticking out? So this is super crazy dangerous. There we go. You have to slow down. Even though the flywheel turns in such a way that it should push that arm back in, it doesn't always.
can feel the air coming in and out of here. I'm going to see if I can make it backfire. I see it backfired a couple of times there. I like it when it backfires like real loud. You can get it to do it sometimes. It's real, real loud. There you go. That was a real backfire. <laughs> When you ground out the spark, it's a good idea to connect the ground first. That way it's very unlikely that it'll, it'll electrocute you. And it does hurt. Um, so that's why I'm wearing the glove. Because it, this guy really throws a spark. It really hurts. Big boy spark. Here we go. Now this is a model airplane engine, and it runs on uh, a nitro fuel. Now this is a um, two-stroke. Now uh, it doesn't have any valves. There's a there's a hole in the side of the cylinder where this exhaust port is, and slightly below that, on the other side, there's a hole that connects to the case of the engine. So the piston goes up and it compresses the air and the fuel. And as this piston goes up, underneath it creates a vacuum underneath the piston. It sucks air and fuel into the uh, crankcase below the piston. Piston reaches the top, it comes down, and as it rotates there's this hole in the crankshaft. That, uh, so this, when, it piston, when the piston travels up, it sucks air and fuel through this carburetor, in through that hole in the crankshaft, and into the uh, crankcase, then it rotates that, that hole in the crankshaft closes, and you know that hole travels along with the crankshaft, and now the um, sealed part of the crankshaft is pressed up against this um, this uh, carburetor. So now the piston travels down. As it comes down, it compresses the air and fuel mixture in the crankcase. It builds up pressure. And then, and as the, and now of course you have all your exhaust in here. So as the piston comes down, the piston passes this first hole. Now of course it's pressurized exhaust gas goes flying out this hole out through the exhaust. Now a little bit after the exhaust has opened, this uh, intake opens and the piston goes all the way down. This pressurized air and fuel uh, mixture is forced into the cylinder and as it comes rushing in it also forces all the uh, leftover exhaust gases out the um, side here and then the uh, piston you know it travels up and it seals those two holes and it sucks more air and fuel into the uh, crankcase. Now of course a little bit of the air fuel mixture leaks into the muffler but not a whole lot. You can actually um, like uh, you can see them on tractors sometimes they actually have these they're really neat. Um, I think they're oh, I Can't remember the name, but there's these um, really neat tractors. They're like a one-cylinder two-stroke They run on like diesel. I can't think of the name of them They actually have tuned exhaust pipes and you can actually get tuned exhaust pipes for small engines like this too And those increase your power just a little bit what that does is as this piston comes down this shock wave of pressurized um, exhaust comes out of the um, cylinder and of course this this uh, you know air fuel mixture comes in and the shock wave travels down to your tuned exhaust pipe and it gets to the other end so your tuned exhaust pipe kind of looks like this it curves out gets to a point and then it curves in with a lot steeper slope than it curved out and so the shock wave gets to this part where it's kind of curved in and the shock wave bounces and it comes back and so your air and fuel mixtures pushed all of the exhaust out of the cylinder and the air fuel mixture is starting to leak out into the exhaust. So the shock wave comes, it bounces and it comes back and the shock wave pushes this air fuel mixture back 
into the um, cylinder and just as the um, piston goes up and it seals off this exhaust port, just the last of that air fuel mixture it gets pushed into the cylinder and of course that increases your compression it gives you more air and fuel it makes it more powerful and more efficient and of course you have to tune the exhaust just right because if that shockwave bounces back too soon it'll push in air and fuel and some exhaust into the cylinder and you don't want that if you have it too late it won't push enough of that air fuel that you're wasting back into the um, cylinder now this runs like a diesel engine it uses nitro and it's a two-stroke so there's actually oil already mixed into the nitro fuel, which is like 30 bucks a gallon. Um, so this runs like a, a, you know, a, a diesel because it has a glow plug. And so just the high compression is actually what makes this stuff um, actually ignite. And so this is a little, this is a little battery. Um, I actually bought this from Kyle. Hi. Um, and so, you know, you stick this on here and this is what powers your glow plug and that glows. Um, and so until this engine is warmed up properly, this glow plug, the heat from this glow plug is what causes this um, air fuel mixture to, you know, really get nice and hot and it causes all that fuel to uh, vaporize uh, properly. So now we're going to attempt to start this. This might take like 75 tries and depending on whether or not we want a full uh, length film, we may or may not include those. Um, we haven't decided yet if we should do a full length film or if we, we should... will. We will. <laughs> Okay, well, Mike thinks we should do a full-length film and not cut out anything, but uh, okay, so I'll just stick this guy here. This is just to hold my rubber band up. Oh, and let me close the carburetor because this guy likes to go nuts. Mm, one other thing I got to do. Let's see. Oh, shit. I got to start the siphon of fuel going from this tank into the carburetor. I forgot to do that. All right, let's see if we can do something. Um, like most model airplane engines, like most model airplane engines, this actually has a spring in the carburetor that pushes the carburetor open and makes it go faster and faster. And of course, this over here is for adjusting the air fuel mixture. Now, this is easily accessible because these engines are very sensitive. Even the slightest changes in humidity and and barometric pressure and so forth will make the engine run differently. So you want to constantly adjust that. I don't. I just I just want it to go slow. That's all I want. <laughs> it doesn't want to do that though. Um, now this has a spring in the carburetor, and the vibrations usually make this um, carburetor open up. It's doing that now, and that's because if something goes wrong in the air and your um, your your uh, uh, what do you call that? Now you know, it wasn't hot enough. Yeah, I took this off and it died. Even if I let it run for a long period of time, it still dies when I take off the glow plug uh, power supply, just because I run it so slow it doesn't get hot enough. But I can't think of the um, name of that, um, but there's this little, um, it's not a solenoid, it's a servo motor or a stepper motor that controls this. Now if that fails in the air, um, you want this carburetor to open because if this engine dies, this would have a propeller on it. The flywheel I stuck on there, this would have a propeller. But if this engine dies um, in the air, your model airplane engine isn't designed uh, to glide. It's, it's, it's just not designed. It's designed to have power. And so it'll very rapidly come down to the ground. And so unless you're extremely skilled and also extremely lucky, uh, it's going to crash and it's going to be destroyed. You're going to lose that time and money that you put into it. And of course, then you got to reinvest that and to fix it or to get another one or something like that. But um, so that's, that's why it has a spring. And of course, I run this at a slow speed. And so that's kind of a, a hassle on my half. That's why I have a weight on there. But even that isn't quite effective. Now, of course, I'm sure you've all seen these before. One of these uh, 
plasma balls. Now these are pretty fun. Um, the high voltage inside of the sealed glass container excites the gas in here and it makes it um, illuminate. You can touch it with your finger and it's perfectly safe because of this distance in here between the high voltage in your finger it has to travel through that gas, which is a high resistance, so it makes it safe to touch. Now, high voltage like this is fun because you can uh, do a multitude of different things with it. You can light up all kinds of gas tubes. For example, standard light bulbs. Uh, you can you can light up here. Let me turn this around. Like this guy here, for example. See if I can. Now, of course, this one has a broken filament, so the uh, high voltage tends to go wherever the uh, filament is. There we go. I don't know if you can see that guy there. Yeah, you see that there. Kind of bouncing around in there. Um, and you can use this uh, high voltage to light up all kinds of stuff. Uh, there's also, for example, you can light up uh, you know, a compact fluorescent light bulb. Um, and th this is, of course, is a flyback transformer. Now, these flyback transformers uh, they come out of, you know, these plasma ball things, and you can take those apart if you, again, if you know what you're doing. Um, and, uh, you, of course, I, I wouldn't recommend it if you're not entirely sure what you're doing. But, um, and now the same with all of these uh, light bulbs here. Once the light bulb is illuminated, it is safe to touch the light bulb. However, be very careful that you don't touch the flyback transformer itself. These tr flyback transformers are also used a lot in uh, televisions, primarily, and, um, old cathode ray tube computer monitors and uh, you can get them out of there and you can actually um, once you get them out of these computer monitors and, and stuff you can actually rig up your very own uh, flyback transformer and a driver for it. Now this light bulb here of course is a um, neon flicker bulb and the entire bulb itself if you look here the entire bulb itself actually illuminates when I attach it to this um, high voltage and now of course electricity now this is a this is a, a light for gymnasium. This is a um, mercury vapor lamp. Now of course um, electricity cannot be seen, heard, felt, touched, smelled. You know any of that stuff. Um, and and so for example, in these bulbs, what you're seeing is this uh, this electricity. This high voltage is traveling through your gas, and it's exciting that gas, and it's it's making it emit light. You're not actually see you're not actually seeing the electricity emit that light. The same thing with uh, lightning. Uh, you're not actually seeing electricity. What you're seeing is the air itself actually being excited by this very high voltage traveling through it, and it therefore uh, illuminates. Uh, thunder, uh, for example, is just that shock wave when that high voltage goes rushing through that air, and it makes that air excited, and that air rapidly lights up, and it rapidly expands. It produces the shock wave, which travels through the air, and that shock wave you hear as thunder. Now, um, let me move this back onto the camera here. Um, this flyback transformer will light up any sealed uh, tube that has a, a, a gas in it, like an inert gas. Um, now, what you're seeing here, this is just a pen, and I wrapped a piece of copper wire around it. But this acts like a load. This right here is a high positive voltage. This, right where this wire is, there is an absence of electrons. There's a shortage of electrons. And that attracts electrons from the surrounding atmosphere. And of course, all of these atoms in this wire here, um, they lack electrons and they are therefore positively charged because they have more neutrons than electrons. And so this uh, attracts electrons from all these surrounding air uh, molecules and atoms and so forth, and it sucks it in into this uh, high voltage cable. And it, therefore, in order to get to that cable, it'll travel the easiest path. It'll travel through, say, a light bulb like this. And as it travels through this light bulb, it will um, excite that light bulb, and it'll, it will cause it to uh, the, the gas in there. It will cause it to excite and illuminate. And um, it'll also it'll travel uh, the path of least resistance. For example, this copper wire. This copper wire here acts as an antenna, almost. And so this, this has a high surface area, and it's really spread out. So all of these air atoms and molecules around this antenna uh, give up electrons, and it travels down this um, piece of copper into this glass tube, and therefore 
into my flyback. And now I use this to make my bulbs light up brighter by giving them a, 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 a larger stream of electrons uh, flowing into them. You know, more electrons flowing into the bulb therefore excites the gas more and it, and it causes it to illuminate more. And I make it uh, brighter by, by uh, doing that. Now this guy here, if I can... Now this guy here, this is a, a really old flash bulb. And I'll hold him up to the camera here and, and uh, I can show you. Uh, you see this is this coil of glass. Now this is filled with xenon. And this would have been used like on a professional camera, like on a set somewhere. Not, of course, in a small portable camera. And it's kind of difficult to see this um, lighting up. Uh, I can't very well hold it while it's uh, illuminated here. But uh, it's kind of this bluish color. And so this high voltage is kind of fun. You can do that with it. And now, of course, again, if you stick your finger in the electrical outlet and you feel pain, you're not feeling electricity. Instead, what you're feeling is this electricity is traveling through your finger. And all of these cells in your finger are dying. And so your finger uh, creates the pain. Your finger sends the pain up to your brain and it's kind of like a warning sing signal. Hey, something's going wrong. Lots of cells are dying. And so that's that pain you feel. You know, uh, if, you s if you smell electricity, it's probably, uh, for example, something burning. If this electricity is causing a, um, something to kind of burn, or for sometimes you'll smell ozone. This high voltage produces um, O3. Now, O2 is just oxygen, and that's what you're breathing right now. Oh, just an oxygen atom by itself usually does not exist. Oxygen likes to combine with itself to make O2, and it, it's happier that way. And it, it's too reactive, just oxygen by itself. So if you have a bunch of oxygen atoms, they will combine into O2. And so that's what you're breathing. Now, when you use high voltage and it, it produces ozone, that's O3. That's, you know, like what's in the atmosphere or the ionosphere or whatever it is that's protecting you from UV light. Now, ozone is incredibly toxic and it destroys your lungs like no tomorrow. And it has a very, very unique smell. So if you're ever working with high voltage and you smell something funny, uh, chances are it's ozone. Um, make sure you move to a well-ventilated area and shut everything off because it will destroy your lungs. And, um, and of course, you can't taste electricity. All you're feeling is pain. And so it cannot be seen, heard, smelt, touched, any of that. Um, it, 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 how, you know, how do we know it exists if we cannot sense it in any way, shape, or form? You know, it's kind of, it's kind of fun. Uh, all, all we're seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and, and all that is just the effects of electricity. We can't actually see the electricity itself. Uh, so this guy right here is a putt-putt boat. This is actually, um, pretty neat how this guy works. Um, in here, there's two pipes coming out the back of the boat, back over here. And inside here, there's a uh, boiler. And that candle, that's that stick you see, that's the candle. The candle's at the other end of that stick. And this boiler is this really thin thing, and it's filled with water. Now, the boiler is very stiff, but the very top membrane of the boiler is flexible. So you fill this boiler with water, and you put the candle underneath of it. Now, this candle heats the water until it boils. And as it boils, of course, it creates steam, and that creates pressure. The it expands, and it forces the hot water out the two pipes and out the back of the boat. And that propels the boat forward. Now, the steam gets into these pipes at the back of the boat, and it cools, and it condenses, and it turns back into a liquid. And it sucks fresh water back into the boiler. And it repeats those cycles very rapidly. And as it repeats those cycles, this flexible membrane on top of the boiler bends really fast. And that's that clicking you hear. And you, it's possible to make a putt-putt boat that operates without a flexible membrane. You can actually have just a coil of copper pipe. And it will do that same thing where the, it boils and it condenses. And it'll, it'll repeat those cycles. But it's not as powerful. It's more powerful and more effective and more noisy if you have a flexible membrane. And, of course, the noise is kind of fun. As you can see here, I'm walking on a uh, uh, public street. And so right now as we speak, a car is passing me. And so, of course, I got to talk over all the uh, cars. Now, the one thing that I mentioned that was um, cut out 
was the fact that a steam engine, any steam engine, will explode once it runs out of water. You have to keep a uh, close eye on how much water is in the boiler because if you run out completely and there's still a good fire going, run away because it will explode. It will be uh, very violent and very, uh, very intense. So you want to make sure you're never, you're never. Uh, uh, behind a, a boiler <laughs> that that is out of water because uh, by, by the time you've seen it's it's out of water it's too late to fix it there's not even enough time to run away at that point so make sure you run really fast so uh, I just wanted to make sure I uh, included that uh, safety tip you see because um, because of course I'm bending the rules a little bit and um, I'm claiming that all of my engine stuff is relevant because quote-unquote safety because I'm showing you what not to do by sitting on the engine. I'm showing you what to do by how to crank to crank it and, um, and the spark advance and retard and how all that works. So I'm incorporating it into safety even though we technically haven't learned that in auto so that's my that's my uh, excuse. And so uh, I want to make sure I include this so that my steam engine um, rant was therefore relevant because it's about uh, safety. So if you'll excuse me I will be back here in a moment. I am on my way to Old Town. I want to thank you all for watching. Uh, my name is Balin Manier. I have been your host and uh, uh, you know, chief of uh, demonstration and chief of information. I want to give a special thanks to our producer and director, um, our co-writer, our uh, cameraman, our editor, uh, our transportation, our peanut gallery, and at our source of constant, unrelenting harassment, uh, Michael Fuller. Uh, this could not have been possible without him. Uh, so thanks so much. So now. Um, if you will excuse me, I'm going to conclude this video uh, by taking my running weed racker engine for a walk through Old Town. Baby.